North Korea launches an intercontinental ballistic missile toward Alaska. The U.S. THAAD system destroys it in space at 150 kilometers altitude in the most critical missile defense test ever conducted, January 15, 2025. Pyongyang, North Korea. At 4.47 a.m. local time, American early warning satellites detected a massive thermal bloom over the Sohe Satellite Launching Station on North Korea's west coast. The infrared signature was unmistakable, a liquid-fueled rocket motor igniting, generating temperatures exceeding 3,000 degrees Celsius, and a plume visible from space. Within three seconds, the detection was confirmed, classified, and transmitted simultaneously to U.S. Strategic Command in Nebraska, NORAD in Colorado, the Pentagon, and the White House Situation Room? The assessment came back in eight seconds. Hwasong-17 Intercontinental Ballistic Missile, estimated range 15,000 kilometers, trajectory analysis in progress. At 4.48 a.m., the missile cleared the launch pad, accelerating rapidly as its first stage rocket motor pushed it skyward. The Hwasong-17, North Korea's largest and most capable ICBM, stood 25 meters tall and weighed over 80 tons at launch. Its liquid-fueled engines, based on decades-old Soviet technology, but refined through years of clandestine development, generated 100 tons of thrust. The missile was designed for one purpose, deliver a nuclear warhead to targets across the continental United States. Intelligence assessments suggested North Korea possessed between 30 and 50 nuclear weapons, though their reliability and yield remained uncertain. What wasn't uncertain was the missile's trajectory. At 4.49 a.m., tracking stations across the Pacific locked onto the Hwasong-17's radar signature. Ground-based radars in Japan and South Korea provided initial trajectory data. Space-based infrared systems tracked the missile's hot exhaust plume, and within 90 seconds of launch, supercomputers at U.S. Strategic Command had calculated the impact point with terrifying precision. The missile was heading northeast, arcing over the Sea of Japan and toward the Bering Sea, its projected trajectory, if no propulsion anomalies occurred, would take it over the Aleutian Islands and toward a splashdown point 200 kilometers south of Anchorage, Alaska. Whether this was intentional provocation, a navigation error, or a test that had catastrophically malfunctioned was irrelevant. An ICBM was heading toward American territory, and the United States had minutes to respond. At 4.50 a.m., the president was awakened and briefed. The conversation lasted 45 seconds. Mr. President, North Korea has launched an ICBM, current trajectory toward Alaska, impact in 28 minutes, VAD batteries on alert. Request authorization to engage. The response was immediate. Authorized, destroy it. At 4.51 a.m., the order was transmitted to Fort Greeley, Alaska, where a terminal high-altitude area defense battery had been on high alert for exactly this scenario. The THAAD system, designed to intercept ballistic missiles during their terminal descent phase, was America's last line of defense against ICBM attacks, and it was about to face its most critical test. The THAAD battery at Fort Greeley consisted of six truck-mounted launchers, each carrying eight interceptor missiles. The system's ANTPY-2 radar, a sophisticated X-band system capable of tracking targets 1,000 kilometers away, had been monitoring the Hwasong-17's trajectory since 30 seconds after launch. At 4.52 a.m., fire control computers calculated intercept solutions based on constantly updating trajectory data. The North Korean missile was now at an altitude of 400 kilometers, having completed its boost phase and entered the mid-course phase where it would coast through space before re-entering the atmosphere for its terminal descent. At 4.53 a.m., THAAD operators received targeting data. The Hwasong-17 would re-enter the atmosphere over the Bering Sea in approximately 22 minutes. Maximum altitude of the trajectory would reach 1,200 kilometers, well into space. The intercept window, the brief period when THAAD missiles could engage the target, 
would open at 5.13 a.m. when the North Korean missile began its descent and entered Thad's engagement envelope. The system was designed to intercept missiles between 40 and 150 kilometers altitude, hitting them during terminal phase before they could reach their targets. Should Thad fire immediately or wait for optimal intercept geometry? Type A for immediate launch. Type B for waiting until the last possible moment. Comment your tactical call. At 5.10 a.m., three minutes before the intercept window opened, THAAD launchers elevated to firing position. The interceptor missiles, each weighing 900 kilograms and measuring 6.17 meters long, were essentially kinetic kill vehicles. They carried no explosive warheads. Instead, they destroyed targets through direct collision at closing speeds exceeding 20,000 kilometers per hour. The kinetic energy from such an impact would vaporize both the interceptor and the incoming warhead, eliminating the threat through sheer physics. At 5.13 a.m., the engagement began. Two THAAD interceptors launched from separate launchers, their solid rocket motors igniting with brilliant flashes visible for kilometers. The missiles accelerated to speeds exceeding Mach 8, climbing rapidly toward their intercept point 150 kilometers above the Bering Sea. The flight time to intercept was calculated at 90 seconds. Onboard infrared seekers cooled to near absolute zero to detect the faint heat signature of the descending North Korean warhead activated as the interceptors left the atmosphere. At 5.14 a.m., the Hwasong-17 re-entered the atmosphere, its nose cone heating to over 2,000 degrees Celsius from friction with air molecules. The thermal signature, brilliant in infrared, was detected by THAAD's radar and transmitted to the interceptors. The first THAAD missile, using this data, adjusted its trajectory mid-flight. Small thruster rockets fired, making tiny course corrections that would position the interceptor directly in the path of the descending warhead. At 5.14 and 30 seconds, the first interceptor's seeker achieved lock. The North Korean warhead, a cone-shaped object traveling at over 7 kilometers per second, was clearly visible on infrared. The interceptor, guided by its onboard computer and making final course adjustments every millisecond, homed in with deadly precision. At 5.14 and 42 seconds, 152 kilometers above the Bering Sea, the interceptor and warhead collided. The closing speed, over 25,000 kilometers per hour, created kinetic energy equivalent to several tons of high explosive. The impact was catastrophic for both objects. The North Korean warhead, whether it carried a live nuclear device or a test payload, disintegrated into thousands of fragments. The THAAD interceptor also vaporized its job complete. The debris, glowing from the heat of impact, created a brief flash visible from the ground in western Alaska. And at Fort Greeley, operators watching radar displays saw the North Korean missile's track disappear, target destroyed, intercept successful. First THAAD combat engagement in history successful. Subscribe to Skyforce now for the most detailed missile defense and strategic operations analysis. This is coverage that goes deeper than anyone else. At 5.15 a.m., confirmation rippled through military command centers worldwide. U.S. Strategic Command transmitted to the Pentagon. ICBM threat neutralized. Debris falling into Bering Sea. No danger to populated areas. The president, still in the Situation Room, received the news and authorized a statement to be prepared. The second thawed interceptor, no longer needed, self-destructed over the ocean to prevent it from becoming a navigation hazard. The debris from the destroyed Hwasong-17 traveling at ballistic speeds when hit continued along roughly the original trajectory, but began breaking up further as pieces re-entered the atmosphere at various angles. Most fragments burned up completely, Larger pieces, including portions of the warhead casing, impacted the Bering Sea across a 50-kilometer swath. U.S. Navy ships were immediately dispatched to recover debris for analysis, a critical intelligence opportunity to examine North Korean missile technology and confirm whether the warhead had been nuclear-armed. 
In Pyongyang, North Korean military officials monitoring the launch initially believed it had succeeded. Telemetry showed normal flight through boost and mid-course phases. But at 5.15 a.m., when the warhead should have been transmitting impact data, all signals ceased. By 5.20 a.m., the realization set in. The missile had been destroyed. American missile defenses, which North Korean propaganda had claimed were ineffective, had worked flawlessly. The regime's most advanced ICBM had been intercepted and destroyed in space. The international response was immediate and intense. The United States released a statement within an hour, confirming that North Korea had launched an ICBM toward American territory and that U.S. defensive systems had successfully intercepted it. Satellite imagery and radar data were declassified and shared with allies to prove the intercept had occurred. Japan and South Korea expressed relief and requested increased missile defense cooperation. China and Russia, while condemning the North Korean launch, remained silent on the American intercept, privately acknowledging that THAAD had performed exactly as designed. For North Korea, the failed launch was a strategic disaster. The Hwasong-17 program, which had cost billions of dollars and years of development, had been proven vulnerable. If the United States could intercept one ICBM, it could potentially intercept many. The regime's nuclear deterrent, the foundation of its survival strategy, suddenly seemed less credible. Within 48 hours, Kim Jong-un ordered the execution of three senior missile program officials, blaming them for the failure. The official North Korean narrative claimed the launch had been a satellite test that experienced technical problems. No mention was made of American interception. Do you think this intercept proves missile defense works? Or was this a best case scenario that won't be repeatable? Share your analysis below. For the United States military, January 15th validated decades of investment in missile defense. The THAAD program, which had cost over $15 billion to develop and deploy, had just achieved its primary mission in the most high-stakes scenario possible. A real ICBM launched with hostile intent had been tracked, engaged, and destroyed. Critics who claimed missile defense was technologically impossible or prohibitively expensive faced irrefutable evidence to the contrary. The debris recovery operation, conducted over five days by U.S. Navy vessels, yielded valuable intelligence. Fragments of the warhead casing were analyzed and confirmed to contain traces of weapons-grade plutonium, proving the Hwasong-17 had carried a live nuclear device. The yield, estimated from the warhead's design, was approximately 50 kilotons, roughly three times the power of the Hiroshima bomb. Had the missile reached its target, the devastation would have been unimaginable. The intercept had prevented not just a provocative test, but potentially a nuclear detonation on or near American soil. Technical analysis of the intercept revealed both successes and areas for improvement. The THAAD system had performed flawlessly, but only two interceptors were fired. Against a salvo attack with multiple warheads or decoys, success was less certain. Defense planners accelerated programs to increase interceptor inventory, improve discrimination between real warheads and decoys, and develop faster engagement cycles. The lesson was clear. One intercept proved the concept. But defending against sophisticated attacks required continued investment and innovation. For the THAAD crews at Fort Greeley, the successful intercept was both triumph and relief. They had trained for years for this exact scenario, running countless simulations and exercises. But simulations, no matter how realistic, couldn't replicate the pressure of knowing a real nuclear weapon was inbound. The operators, in post-mission debriefs, described the engagement as surreal. Everything happened so fast. The training took over. We did our jobs, and the system worked. Their professionalism under pressure had potentially saved thousands of lives. The geopolitical implications extended far beyond the immediate crisis. North Korea, its most advanced missile intercepted, faced a choice. Accelerate its ICBM program to develop countermeasures and overwhelm American defenses, 
or accept that its nuclear deterrent was compromised and seek diplomatic solutions. The regime chose the former, announcing plans to test improved missiles with multiple warheads and maneuvering capabilities designed to evade interception. The arms race, far from ending, escalated. For American allies in the Pacific, the successful intercept was reassurance that extended deterrence, the U.S. commitment to defend them with its own forces, remained credible. Japan and South Korea, both within range of North Korean missiles, requested accelerated deployment of additional THAAD batteries. Australia expressed interest in acquiring the system, and Taiwan, facing a far larger missile threat from China, inquired about access to missile defense technology. The strategic balance in the Pacific had shifted, and nations were adjusting their defense postures accordingly. As winter storms swept across the Bering Sea, erasing the last traces of debris, the impact of January 15th continued to resonate. The first combat intercept of an ICBM had been achieved, the technology worked, the training paid off, and the United States had demonstrated that attacking its territory, even with the most advanced weapons, would face active defenses capable of stopping the threat. But the victory was incomplete. One intercept didn't guarantee success against future attacks. It was proof of concept, not proof of invincibility. For the families living in Alaska, unaware until hours later how close they had come to nuclear attack, the intercept was a stark reminder of the world they lived in. Rogue nations possessed weapons capable of reaching American cities, and only constant vigilance, advanced technology, and skilled operators stood between those weapons and catastrophe. The THAAD system, once an abstract acronym, became a tangible shield they depended on for survival. Now I want three perspectives from you. First, does this successful intercept change the strategic calculus for nuclear-armed adversaries, or will they simply develop countermeasures? Second, should the United States expand missile defense systems even if it risks accelerating arms races. Third, what are the ethical implications of defending against nuclear weapons while maintaining a large nuclear arsenal ourselves? Comment your strategic and ethical analysis below. Your insights drive the conversations we have on Skyforce. And if this breakdown of the most critical missile defense engagement in history gave you new understanding of how America defends against existential threats, prove it by hitting that like button, subscribing to Skyforce, and turning on notifications. Until next time, stay informed, stay sharp, and remember that the shield is only as strong as the technology behind it and the people operating it.